Okay, so thanks for the invitation to talk. Um, I've struggled at the end of the day, people are tired and before coffee, so I'm going to take a kind of rapid-fire approach to this in the hope of, in the hope of keeping you awake. Um, I guess I really want to make two Would points. I'm not going to take a talk about Australian rugby at all. I'm not interested in sport. I think New Zealand is interested in sport. Um, I guess I really want to make two points. One is almost a political point about how I feel we should approach the discussion around impact. And the other is a technical point around the way the world, in fact, works today and the impact of the web on that. Um, I want to start by making, emphasising the fact that I want you to take these ideas and this talk and I want you to do things with them. You are free to do all of these things. You are also free to take notes and to think and criticise um, as well. Um, but before I get on to the, to the talk, I want to thank a few people. Um, a lot of people have influenced my thinking over the years. Um, this is an incomplete list, as is this um, and as is this. But I think it's a key point that we actually recognise and cite and attribute the contributions to our work. And this is particularly true as a scientist. Um, but enough about them. Let's talk about me. Um, so I live in Bath and every morning I travel 60 miles to the Rutherford Appleton lab. I work for STFC, but I should say I am not representing STFC in this setting, and nothing I say should be taken as representing the STFC position. I work for a funder, but I'm fundamentally a research scientist. So I write grants, I write papers, um, but I also actually get to do some interesting stuff as well. Um, and I'm not going to tell you what this is specifically, but it's interesting. This is a project that started off as something, an exploration, something that's fun, something that was never funded despite many applications, but is now actually being um, applied into what might become a clinical device. So why do, I, why do I do this? Why do I get up every morning and do the 60 mile train trip into work? Well, first answer is why a lot of us have a job. Let's be honest about this, that we're motivated by the ability to actually put food on the table and, and have somewhere to live. Um, but obviously there's more to it than that. Um, I've always been the kind of person who was sticking their fingers into things, trying to figure out how things work and take them apart. Um, and every now and then, not all the time, but every now and then you get that sense of that amazement that you had in kindergarten or as a small child, actually seeing something, understanding something, and just that's incredibly exciting. And after years of being a sort of conventional researcher doing, my, doing on, the, on the greasy pole, trying to get up, up the ladder. You come to realise that this is, it's a privilege to be able to do this. Um, and it's certainly not a right. Public funding of science is not a sheltered housing scheme for people with PhDs. So that led me to sort of change a little bit the approach of what I was doing in terms of what I thought I could deliver as a researcher in terms of what my capabilities were. And it certainly led me to think about value for money and what the value for money I offer the tax holder, taxpayer is. Um, so I work mainly these days on technique development, um, quite a lot on information technologies, but enabling technologies and tools. And the reason I do that is because these are the kind of things where a small change a small delivery that I can make to the rest of the research community can have a very large effect. I've also, over the years, become a very strong advocate of open research practice in general terms, um, open access to the research literature so that anyone can read it, understand it and act on it, but also access to data, and not just to data, but the underlying process, the materials, the software ensuring that the objects, the outputs we create as researchers are available and optimised for people to reuse them, to use them in different contexts um, and to be, take those into different places. Not what is really the traditional approach to research communication, which is to put it in a place which is almost totally antithetical to the notion of actually having it used by other people. I mean, we communicate research in a way where we can't actually fit in the description of what we did. We don't, for the most part, actually provide the results. We don't provide the methods. And then we essentially lie about how we did it 
and the story of how it came to be anyway, because it doesn't make a good story. So the only difference here that really is, is the difference between traditional research communication is I haven't stuck a fish on the bicycle. So I've come to these realisations over time. I've, I've, I've thought and changed the way I approach things. I've had a few insights along the way. So naturally you'd expect, as I go out and talk to other researchers, they will share these insights and adopt these kind of approaches, um, making everything available, more effective communication, um, sharing everything more readily. Um, of course, since that is no, um, the traditional approach uh, response of most of my colleagues um, is something along this. You can see the rattle has just been thrown out of the pram. Um, and the reasons for this uh, are actually perfectly reasonable, perfectly understandable, because every time there is a grant scheme or a job is advertised, you get this kind of effect where the decision-making process is something like this. It really is the case that the difference between getting the grant and getting the job is the outputs in the right venues. Not whether anyone's read them, not whether anyone's used them, certainly not what the downstream effect is. The question is, have you got your papers in science, nature, cell? And as a result of that, what we're effectively doing is, as a community, we optimise for prestige. We optimise for the prestige of people, of research outputs, and of institutions. And we do that rather than optimising for the use and reuse of those research outputs. And that's because of the way the incentives work. It's the way the entire incentive structure is driven, and it's certainly the way the incentive structure is perceived. There's a wonderful story about a pin factory. I have no idea whether it's actually true in Soviet, in Soviet Russia, so USSR, I should say, where they were assessed each year on the weight of pins that they generated. So the obvious solution was to make one really big pin. Incentives skew behaviour, they change behaviour. What you measure is what you get, and what you say you're going to measure is what people are going to do. So here is the dean of your local research intensive university. Um, as you provide the incentives in the right way, we can argue that the ponderously, perhaps, we'll move towards achieving more of our aims. So it is purely about incentives. It's purely about getting the incentives right. And that's what led me into an interest in research assessment. The argument that if we change the incentives, then the behaviour will follow. So I have an agenda. Completely upfront about that. So, Let's revert now and ask this question again a little bit more precisely. So why do we measure research? Why do we assess research? Well, this question has been answered in many ways over the course of the day. One of the answers, which hasn't been explicitly made, is specifically this, to encourage and reward the behaviour that we're after. Now, funders don't like saying this, and they don't like admitting to it, but even if it's not explicitly true in terms of the policy objective, what is assessed does change and affect behaviour. Um, so whether you like it or not, this is a motivation behind assessment. Reporting has come up quite a lot, reporting to stakeholders, reporting to government, reporting to councils. And obviously this is an important activity. And in the modern world, transparency is something that's quite critical. What hasn't been talked about is a kind of higher level question. Talked a little bit about strategy. But what we've not talked about is questions about the architecture of the community, the architecture of the research effort. Do we assess to ask questions about how we structure the way we fund research, the research we choose to fund, and the way we organise the community? So let me pose you a question. Uh, I'll come back to this in a second. This is, so this is this, but this is a question that I posed to you. Do we, do we want to fund the best science or do we want to fund the best outcomes when we deal with research? And I ask that question because I think there's an elephant in the room at the core of all this that we're not really addressing. And that elephant is the question of why we do research at all. Why as a society do we choose to put significant proportions 
of GDP into research? Why do the public choose to fund charities to fund research? Why do governments fund research? And it's, of course, it's not really governments. It's actually taxpayers. And of course, it's not the public, which is a term we should ban, but of course, we are part of that public. We're part of a contributing aspect of that. So, so there are a number of reasons why society funds research. One of the most obvious ones and one of the most easiest ones to sell is medical advances, cures to disease. There's a reason why medical charities funded by the public are successful in a way that physics charities and chemistry charities are not. There's also a real element of excitement and interest. People are actually interested, even if they don't understand that the muons may or may not have gone faster than the speed of light between the LHC and Grand Sargasso. And that drives interest in and the development of, of expertise in science and in, in technical areas for a society. But again, prestige is a very big part of it, and it's a part we don't openly acknowledge. Press release from business, um, business and Innovation Department of the UK government today talking about a result that looked, talking about a study that looked at the outputs of UK research, fundamentally stressed all the prestigious elements of that research, that we're ahead of the Americans on this, that and the other, um, that we're more productive. Um, but it was fundamentally focused on prestige. If you want a really hard example of that, consider the research assessment exercise last time around. A, it came to the wrong answer with respect to several universities. Those pockets of expertise, pockets of excellence, if you recall, that were then serially defunded because they weren't in Oxford and Cambridge. Um, but also, think, think about the way that this research is, is ranked and described. Research of national relevance. The research which is focused on this country, that is embedded in the local environment, is deemed not significantly important enough to fund. That's a perfectly rational decision to make. If you want to fund a national research effort for prestige, that's a choice to make. But it's a choice to make, not something to do by default. So, let me come back to that question. You've got to split people down the middle, I would expect. For me, in a sense, it's a no-brainer. You want to fund results out the end. And there are cases where funding the best science will not put that outcome. You can create great software through development, but no one's going to use that software until you've dealt with the interface. The interface is not great science. It's necessary. It's not hard work. Another question. Is it better to maintain a, a diverse research community spread across a wide range of institutions, or should you concentrate your effort inside a small number of institutions, arguing for critical mass? Do you invest in infrastructure, or, or do you fund <coughs> research projects? You know, these, are, these are all choices, and they're usually presented as theological issues of argument. They're, people have positions on these. We don't usually discuss them. But, and I think Julia made this point, they're not theological issues, they're engineering questions. They're questions of optimizations. They're questions of optimizing a complex system. But you know, we deal with complex systems. We understand a lot about complex systems. It's a question of getting smart people to get the data together, to get the basis for making those decisions, and understand how all of these things relate. But they're only engineering questions when we actually answer the core question, which again is what do we actually want as a society from research? And that's not a straightforward question. I don't necessarily have an answer, um, and I don't think I should have an answer in many ways. I mean, we want impact. We don't actually know what we mean by impact. We haven't really had that conversation. So where do we go from here? What can we actually do in a, in a productive sense? How can, we, how can we address the agenda and take things forward? So I'd argue that we're stuck with this word. Politicians like it. Elements of government like it. 
There's a lot hanging off it. But I would also argue, given that we don't know what we mean by it, that we have a real opportunity to grasp the agenda. Words have power. And if we choose to act and define on our terms and make sense of them, build the tools that address those terms and those definitions, then we can take control of the debate. And if we don't, then someone else will. So, this is my view of how we approach the question. And it's based on a fundamental assertion. That what we want to see, the reason we fund research ultimately is because we want to see it used. And we want to see it used in the right places, whether that's in a medical setting, in an educational setting, in further research, in an academic setting, or in a commercial setting. We want to see it used at the right time because we know that research can take a long time to mature. We know that the environment for its use, the technology required for its use, may not be there for 10, 15, 20, 30 years. So we want research to be reused and we want it to be reusable for the future. So my argument at its core is that when we're talking about impact, all the kinds of different impact we refer to are all kinds of reuse. The application of research is reuse. The commercialization of research is reuse. It's use in education. It's use in engagement. All of these things are the reuse of research. But also the traditional measures what researchers think of as impact is also a measure of reuse. Citation in particular is an indication that research is being used and is being reused. So if the argument is that we can shape the debate around what research should be, what the community should look like, what the architecture of the research effort should look like by measuring reuse, then I think a fair question is can we measure reuse. Um, and of course at a trivial level we can. Incidentally, if you actually want to look at the websites, um, in principle if you point a mobile phone at the QR codes they should take, take you to the right place. So this is a measure of, if you like, the reuse of my research. This is um, Google Scholar um, profile with a set of my papers and the number of citations they've received. That's a measure of reuse. It's a measure of impact, as would be widely accepted by, by a large number um, of my colleagues and indeed my line management. Of course, we know that citations aren't necessarily the, the best measure of this. We've heard some of the reasons for that. If you accept that, this is actually work done at the journal level, not the individual paper level. Um, this work by Jan Bollum and the Measure Project. That they looked at a wide number of, of different measures of, of journal, journal reuse. And what's interesting is that there's a cluster over here that had to do with citation. And what this has actually come from is um, Clickstream. It's actually looking at people looking at papers on web of science and a few other sources. Those are measures of citation, which all seem to cluster around other things you might think of as prestige. Up in that corner, they're actually measures of use, people actually looking at things, actually downloading the PDF version, those kind of, those kind of measures. So it's kind of interesting that there's this citation as use measures, but I don't really put this up just to complain about citation measures. The reason I put this up, the reason I picked this particular picture is because it's made up of data based on 100 million clicks through websites not on a couple of thousand citations, but tens or hundreds of thousands of people interacting with the research literature, and it's all been measured. Most of our activity, most of what we do, now happens on the web in one form or another. And that means that we are interacting with these objects no longer in a way where you would have gone to the library and pulled something down and perhaps been able to photocopy it and include it in your report without anyone noticing that you'd stolen it. 
All of this now happens on the web. Even if you don't acknowledge it, there's someone within about five minutes, see under German politicians' PhDs, for instance, is going to figure out this has been taken from somewhere. And more to the point, those tracks as people interact with all of these objects can all be followed. The systems can be followed. You create a track, a stream of what has happened, of the way you interact, of the way you reuse the different objects you're relating to. Here's an example. Work by Martin Fenner um, on a thing he's calling Science Card. Um, some, a couple of these things are sort of inspired by a concept from Paul Groth, some of you will you know, some of you will know, who said, I want a baseball card, my academic baseball card. Um, again, the notion of the personal profile comes up. I didn't actually do anything to create this. This is all pulled automatically from information freely on the web. We have some citation information down here. This is from Scopus. This is from citations of Public Central. But we also have some other traces. These are people bookmarking my papers. People who've decided to select that paper and put it in their own personal library, either on Mendeley or site you like, presumably because it's of some interest to them, either because they agree with me or they violently disagree with me. Not sure which yet. But they don't always match up with the number of citations. It's a different kind of measure of interaction and reuse, but it's one that is tracked as a side effect of what people are already doing. Here's another one. This is altmetric.com from U and 80. And this is actually tracking the number of tweets associated with particular papers. Um, the one at the top happens to be one from the archive. And so you've not only got the conversation that's occurring around these papers, you've got some sort of measure of how many people are interested in them. And a measure that's extremely rapid. Those papers went live in the last two weeks. This may not necessarily be information that you'd want to look at five years down the track and reflect back on what was happening. But if you want a rapid measure of how much interest a paper is generating, then this is not a bad way to do it. The data's very hazy at the moment, but it also looks like the number of tweets a paper receives may be a better predictor of its eventual number of citations than the journal it appears in. So we have bookmarks that are reused. There are discussion around these objects, which is reused. And we can track all of these things, some better than others, some more effectively than others, and some more accurately and precisely than others. But we have the potential, certainly, to track all of them. But so far, I've only really talked about papers, the conventional, the traditional research output. What about software? something that's regarded increasingly as an important part of, of research communication, certainly an important research output, one that's heavily reused. Data, again, something critically important that we handle extremely badly for the most part. Presentations, blog posts, all of these other things that are a growing part of the research output, all of which are exposed on the web, or if they aren't, then no one's using them for the most part and all of which can arguably be tracked by downloads, tweets, again, records of people interacting with them. Here's another example of a website um, with a great name. It just so happens that Jason Prem ha happened to have this domain name. So this is work um, ahead of people by Jason Prem, uh, Mark Anel, Christian DePara, and Paul Groth um, came out of a workshop that I ran a couple of months ago Again, looking at this sort of personal dashboard, but now wanting to capture things from a range of different sources. So you can put in things like slide share profiles where you put your presentations up, data sets that you put on Drive. And interestingly, because the data is there, because it's well organised, you can get information from the NIH about papers associated with grants as well. So you can see numbers of downloads, numbers of views, numbers of interactions, numbers of uses of, of presentations, of data sets, and indeed if you want to be boring, you can even look at traditional papers. All of this information grabbed from the web, 
pull down as a result of the trace that people leave behind, as a result of what they're doing going about their regular research. It's not even very difficult. I've shown you three services. The first two produced by one person. In both cases, over the, most of the work was done over the course of a weekend. The third one, the core was built in 16 hours. The hard part was all the work that had to be done afterwards to make it stable and make the interface nice so that people could use it, so that people would want to interact with it. But this is actually pretty easy to pull information down on. A lot of this is very accessible. Which, for those of you spending tens of thousands of pounds on reports from Thomson Reuters and Web of Science, might um, raise a few questions. <laughs> OK. That's fine. That's very practical. That's very pragmatic. You know, what are the downstream uses of these things? How are they being used? How are they having an impact? What about the Blue Skies research? What about the stuff that takes decades to mature? And the thing I like about this argument is that I think we can capture this and we can actually get around the usual problem that we have when we talk about the impact of non-directed, of blue skies, of curiosity-driven research. And that is that we know perfectly well that most of this will not be applied. But we know we need a portfolio of it and we know we need to make sure that it can be used. So we need to maximise the potential for its discovery and reuse. And again, I return to the argument about where we are at the moment in terms of prestige. It's more important now to publish in a journal where you get lots of brownie points than it is to make sure that the data and the process for your research is available. We keep making this argument that the government must fund curiosity-driven research. But it's there, it's investment in the future for, for innovation that will happen in 10, 20, 30 years' time. Have you tried to find a paper from 30 years ago recently? So if people are funding this kind of research, then it's relatively straightforward to say, well, there is a burden on you to show if you're doing this kind of research, if the, if the applications are not near term, if you don't know what they are, what you need to do is ensure that the discovery and reusability of your research is of the highest standard. Ensure that potential for the future. So, so my argument is that if we measure reuse and reusability, if we say that we value these things, if we build these things into the fundamental fabric of the way we assess and evaluate research, then we will automatically be optimising for the impact of that research, whether in the near term or the long term. And the easiest way to ensure usability, reusability, the unexpected reuses, the unexpected outcomes and the unexpected impact is, of course, to make it open. That's the whole point of the argument for open research practice, is to ensure that the technical, legal infrastructure is in place to ensure the reusability of this research in the maximum number of different settings that are possible. But again, the thing I like about this argument is it's not the only way. This is not a religious position. This is an optimization position. There will be cases where you need to take a route which is not completely open. I told you at the beginning about a research project which was turning into possibly a clinical device. I didn't tell you what that device was. And I didn't tell you because we probably need to patent it before we can get the investment to turn that into a viable, useful thing that will help people, help people's health. That's a choice I've had to make. But it's a choice I've made based on trying to understand what is the optimum path to maximising the potential for this to be used in the future. Sometimes it will be better to publish in the closed access journal or in a trade journal, which is not available to everyone because it gets to the right audience. But those are choices that people should be making. And that's kind of the core point. OK, so I've made an argument. I've talked about incentives. I've talked about using assessment and evaluation of a particular kind 
to change behaviour. But is, but is that enough? Is that going to solve the entire problem? Um, and I'm going to say it's not. And it's not for a particular reason. So I talked about technical and legal infrastructure. We also need the social infrastructure to support the kind of research process and community that we want. We talk about using evaluation and assessment to change behaviour. We're not talking about infrastructure, we're talking about scaffolding. We're talking about putting things in place to support particular kinds of behaviour. But if you take it away, then that kind of behaviour is not going to continue. People will do the minimum. You can respond to that, obviously, by over-engineering things and trying to push people one way or another. You can regulate, you can create policy. But there's a real risk, again, that people just do the minimum. I would just do the minimum. I'm, you know, I'm busy. There are other things I'd, be, I'd rather be doing. So we need to think about more than just incentives, more than just evaluation and more than just policy. This is the scissor arch at Wells Cathedral. Arguably a very beautiful piece of architecture. It's structurally supporting the tower of Wells Cathedral. It was put in about 250, 300 years after the cathedral was built because the tower was falling down. We have what we have. We have the community that we have. But what we need to do is work with our existing processes, our existing approaches, and with the fact that people are human. And we need to build the kind of infrastructure that supports the world we want to live in. And I think that fundamentally comes down to asking questions about what our values are. Are the values we have as a research community now enough to support research into the 21st century? And I argue that they're not. What does a social contract for research look like in the 21st century where people expect to be able to interact with the results of government funding, where people expect to be able to engage, where governments can no longer hide information and where experts are not automatically deferred to just because they have a couple of letters after their name? What are the kind of values that are important to growing a research community that's fit for purpose in the 21st century. I don't have the answers to that. I don't have, certainly have even part of the answers. But I'd argue that part of it is ensuring that your research outputs are created in a way that supports reuse. That one of the values of the community should be optimising our outputs so that they are useful and reusable. I'd say another set of values is to expand our existing set of values around citation and attribution, to expand them beyond just the things that appear in journals, just the things that have a DOI, to all of the other things we use, materials, people, grants, all the things that contribute to that process and acknowledging them effectively and appropriately. And in doing so, by cr to create the links, that can then be tracked across the web. I think impact as a concept, as an idea that we want research to have outcomes, that we want it to make a difference, will be at the heart of this. And I hope we'll have a commitment to efficiently and cost-effectively converting the investment that is made into usable outputs and to maximising the reuse, potential reuse, for the long term of the things that we're creating. To do that, we have to go back to that question. We have to go back to what the elephant, to the elephant in the room. Why do we, either in this country or globally, decide to fund research? Do we? decide to fund research, or do we put it into social care? 
That answer could very well be different in different countries. And arguably, there are some countries in the global south who made a much better job of valuing developmental research which is relevant to the local community than has been done in the UK. But above all, as we answer that question, we no longer live in a world where we can tell the public and the government what to do as we answer that question, as we seek to figure out what we are doing. This kind of megaphone diplomacy is no longer acceptable. If the fracas at the University of East Anglia didn't show you that, I don't know what will. We do need to listen more as a community, but we also need to have that conversation. And again, the thing I would emphasise at the end of the day is that we're part of this discussion. There is no public. There is no such thing. There is only the community of people and what we decide to do. And that's what we've got to decide. Thank you.